you know. <laughs> you know, I, I actually had Jeff on the list uh, until yesterday morning, and he compared himself to Tim Tebow. <laughs> and, and Jeff, if you're going to compare yourself to Tim Tebow, you have to look like Tim Tebow. Ah, uh, well, we are, uh, hopefully we can lower ourselves enough here to be able to process what the Lord has to say to us today about humility. Kind of talking through, going through the fruit of the Spirit, if you've been observant, you know that, we're on the goodness, that's part of the fruit of the Spirit, and people who inhabit, they... Uh, Take on the character of the fruit of the Spirit. You will be a magnetic person. Think of a person. Think of your best friends and the ones that are full of love and joy and peace and patience. Aren't they the funnest ones to hang around? There's something magnetic about them. As Christians, we don't want to necessarily attract people to us. We want to attract people to the God that we love. And uh, the fruit of the Spirit help us do that. They make the Christian message authentic to a lost world. Okay? So uh, let's talk about sacrificial humility today. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we do pray that you would just guide our thoughts and our hearts today, Lord, as we uh, look at this topic of humility um, Father, just help us, help us to process this, Lord. Hard thing to get a handle on, exactly what this looks like and what it isn't. And so help us with this. Teach us through your word, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. From 1984 to 1986, Peggy Noonan was the White House speechwriter for President Reagan. She also wrote a book about her beloved boss. She so enjoyed working for Reagan. She called her book When Character Was King. And here's one of the stories she tells that reveals so much about our 40th president. She says this, a few days after President Reagan had been shot, when he was well enough to get out of bed, he wasn't feeling well, so he went into the bathroom, connected to his room, slapped some water on his face, and some of the water slopped out of the sink. He got some paper towels, got down on the floor to clean it up. An aide went in to check on him, found the President of the United States on his hands and knees on the cold tile floor, wiping up the water with paper towels. Mr. President, the aide said, what are you doing? Let the nurses take care of that. And he said, oh no, I made this mess and I'd hate for a nurse to have to clean it up. Now, that's an interesting story, isn't it? Once you develop a realistic view of your own importance, you start to realize that every other person on this earth is just as precious to God as you are and just as deserving of love and respect as you are. The Bible says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Bible scholar William Barclay calls this one of the most practical and helpful principles in the entire Bible. He says, every economic problem would be solved if men could, if men live for what they could do for others and not for what they could get for themselves. Every political problem would be solved if the ambition of men was only to serve others and not just to enhance their own prestige. Every church problem would be solved if the divisions and disputes which tear the church asunder would for the most part never occur if the only desire of the church was to serve the church and not to care in which position they serve. When Jesus spoke of the supreme greatness of servanthood, he laid down one of the greatest practical truths in the world. 
the single most powerful way to grow in humility is to serve others. The concept of serving others is found more than 300 times in the Bible. When we start serving, we take our eyes off of ourselves and we begin to see the world through the eyes of others. Jesus said, whoever desires to be great among you, let him be a servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be a slave. So how exactly do we do this? That's what we're going to look at today. There's no better passage of Scripture to investigate this than 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. This passage is written especially to elders, to the leaders of the church, but really the principles, they apply to all of us. All of us should aspire to these principles. So I'm going to look at five of these principles, principles for serving with humility. The first principle is this, we're to serve voluntarily with a willing heart. Look at verse 1. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, one who also will share in the glory to be revealed, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. Look again at those last words. Serving not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. The obvious point is that God wants us to be motivated by a heart that is full of love. God wants us to be motivated by an internal conviction rather than external pressure. A few weeks ago at our Asian cooking class, our missionaries in East Asia, Josh and Tammy Hunt, shared the fascinating story of how God has led them to adopt a little Chinese girl named Macy Lin, who had some very serious health needs. And we were hunting around this week to find a picture of the Hunt family with little Macy, and uh, Cindy was able to locate this one here from Josh. So there she is, a little cutie in the middle there. Those of you that have been through the adoption process, you know what a huge undertaking this is. But Josh and Tammy stepped out with a willing heart. They sure weren't looking for more things to do. They already had three children, a very full life, tons of ministry opportunities. And then God broke their hearts for little Macy Lynn. They weren't driven by obligation. They were driven by love. After all, that's how they ended up in East Asia in the first place. Josh, Josh also shared his testimony that night. He described himself, he says, you know, I was just an average college kid, loved to party on weekends, and then God got a hold of his life. Filled him with meaning and purpose. And then God gave him a beautiful bride and a new assignment by breaking their hearts, Josh and Tammy, for the Chinese people, they went willingly with the good news, the best news in the whole wide world, that there is a God who loves us, who loves the Chinese people, a Christ who died for us, died for the Chinese people, and a Jesus who wants a personal relationship with us and the Chinese people. The first principle in serving with humility is to serve voluntarily with a willing heart. Now the second principle in serving with humility is to serve unselfishly with an eager heart. Did you love that cute little picture there? She's offering her apple with an eager heart. Heart. Verse 2, it says, not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Other translations say, not for shameful gain, 
not for sordid gain. In other words, you're not to serve others for what you can get out of it. Jesus put it this way. He said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The very first thing we have to do is die to self, which is really hard to do in the age of the selfie, isn't it? 35-year-old Trevin Wax recently wrote a whole book about our self-centered age. He called it, This Is Our Time, Everyday Myths in Light of the Gospel. It's a great book. Christianity Today called Trevin one of 33 millennials shaping the next generation of evangelicals. I found it fascinating that the first chapter was about cell phones. And the impact these magic little boxes are having on our whole culture. Trevin says, your phone tells you you are the center of the universe. Now, Trevin is quick to point out how much he loves his phone. I mean, after all, it's tailored to his every need. Every setting, every app revolves around his interest, and yet he worries what it's doing to him. Trevin says, nothing else makes me feel more in control, more godlike, more knowledgeable, more connected. Now, the answer isn't to get rid of your cell phone. They're here to stay, folks. But the answer is to control your phone and not let your phone control you. And the same is true of television, the same is true of the internet, the same is true of materialism, the same is true of sports. I love basketball. My nephew is a social media director for the Minnesota Timberwolves. So now I get all of the inside scoop. What's going to happen to Jimmy Butler? I can read articles about that ad infinitum. I love that stuff. But what happens with any of our activities and our interests is that it's so, so easy to fill our lives with all of this stuff to the point we don't have any gas in the tank to serve others, including even the people that are close to us. God calls us to be eager to serve. We need to ask ourselves the hard questions. Am I as eager to serve as I am to play golf? Am I as eager to serve as I am to check my Facebook? Am I as eager to serve as I am to watch my favorite show on TV? And when I do serve in some way, am I overly fixated on what I can get out of it? Or can I serve freely? No strings attached. The second principle in serving with humility is to serve unselfishly, with an eager heart. Third principle in serving with humility is to serve gently, with a Christ-like heart. Verse 3 says, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. This word lording over someone, it refers to a desire to control them, to, to dominate them. We're not to do that. Rather, we're to serve, to serve freely, graciously, unselfishly, in a way that others can model. And our ultimate example, folks, is none other than Jesus himself. This was a hard lesson for the disciples to learn. Even after being with Jesus for three years, James and John, they're still angling for the top spot in heaven. Imagine Jesus having to deal with this pettiness. His crucifixion's only a few days out and he has to deal with James and John and what position they're going to have in heaven. And you know what? Jesus basically chewed them out. They had it all wrong, Jesus said. 
he says this, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. He says this, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What does this look like? Earlier in this public ministry, Jesus said to the disciples, Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. There's a lot of confusion today about what it means to be humble. I'm reminded of a true story about the pastor of Moody Church in Chicago back in the 1940s. Pastor Harry Ironside thought he wasn't being as humble as he should be, and so he asked one of his elders what he could do about it. The elder replied, make a sandwich board with scripture on it and walk through the business district of downtown Chicago for an entire day. So Pastor Ironside did it for a whole day. He got home that night and he found himself saying to himself, you know, there's not another person in all Chicago that would have done something like that. (laughs) look at me (laughs) and you see that's the problem with humility isn't it the very moment we think we finally have becoming humble simply by recognizing that we are prideful so how do we handle this I believe it is helpful to distinguish being humble from being humiliated A humiliated person feels weak and enslaved. A humble person, like Christ, feels strong to serve others. A humiliated person feels helpless and hopeless. A humble person, like Christ, feels helpful and hopeful. A humiliated person feels powerless and dishonored. A humble person, like Christ, feels empowered and dignified humiliation tears down humility builds up humiliation is a tragedy humility is a choice I love the story that's told about three young men who lived in in Detroit in the 1930s one day they board a bus and attempt to pick a fight with a passenger who's sitting alone in the back seat And they threw insult after insult at him. The man said nothing in response. Eventually the bus came to the man's stop. He stood up. He pulled out his business card from his pocket, handed it to one one of the men as he stepped off the bus. The card read simply, Joe Lewis, boxer. The three men had tried to pick a fight with the future heavyweight boxing champion of the world, a title Joe Lewis held for an unprecedented 12 years from 1937 to 1949. He could easily have given those men the fight that they wanted. No one would have blamed him, but he restrained himself. And those three lucky men were given a first-hand look at humility, power under control. I love that definition. It really fits Jesus to a T. When Jesus said, I could have called 10,000 angels, he had access to all of the powers of heaven but he didn't use it. Jesus is the very personification of power under control. Third principle in serving with humility is to serve gently with a Christ-like heart. The fourth principle in serving with humility is to serve expectantly with a faithful heart. 
Verse 4, it says, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Now let me give you another definition for humility. It, it too fits Jesus to a T. David, Pastor David Jeremiah says, Humility is the ability to use the power and resources we possess for the good of others. Humility is not thinking less about yourself. It is thinking about yourself less. There's nothing wrong with expecting appropriate respect and appreciation for your work. God does not want you to be a doormat. He also doesn't want you craving recognition. Or worse yet, demanding recognition. You see, there's no contest here. In heaven, we won't be elbowing each other out to get to the front of the line. On the other hand, we should all long to hear praise from our Savior and Lord. We should long to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Over and over again, God promises that humility will be rewarded. Isn't that what verse 6 says? Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, in order that what? That he may lift you up in due time. James 4.10 teaches the same thing. It says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and, what does it say? He will lift you up. You see, another common misconception about humility is to equate it with excessive self-deprecation. Have you ever been around someone who's always putting themselves down? And they're always pointing out all the sacrifices that they have made? And often it feels to you like they're trying to manipulate a compliment out of you. Let's be clear, that's not humility. That's a martyr complex. True humility takes effort. Putting others first does not come naturally. A life of humility begins in the mind. It starts with how you perceive yourself and your purpose. Does my life revolve around self or does my life revolve around others? Muhammad Ali once joked, he said, at home I'm a nice guy, but I don't want the world to know that. Humble people don't get very far. The Bible says not true, Mr. Ali. Not true. It's not true because God tallies the final score. Jesus put it like this. He said, when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do, to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Let's be clear, there's nothing wrong with being recognized for our accomplishments. A job well done should be commended. The problem comes when recognition by others becomes your motive. Rather, let recognition by God be your motive. And ultimately, folks, we work for him, and he will render the final verdict. The fourth principle in serving with humility is to serve expectantly. You will be rewarded if you serve with a faithful heart. Now the fifth principle of serving with humility is to serve submissively with a gracious heart. Look at verse 5. Young men, in order, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. 
I love watching LeBron James play basketball. He's a marvel to behold. But it's after the game that makes me cringe. (laughs) Especially when they win. And he's jumping on the scorer's table and he's beating his chest. And then he gets on social media and he compares himself to Michael Jordan. There is no doubt that he is a physical specimen that is a rare commodity. And yet in the end, he lives each day by the grace of God. And like all NBA stars, he's one blowing knee away from the end of his career. I think young men are singled out here in verse 5 because young men, having been one, (laughs) can easily be gripped by pride. When our bodies and minds are young, they're strong, they're vibrant, our energy seems boundless. But let's face it, folks, it doesn't last. You look at that word submission there. You know, it's a rare person who actually likes the word submission. And yet it's taught all over in the Bible. The Bible teaches submission to government. The Bible teaches submission to law enforcement. The Bible teaches submission to our employers. The Bible teaches submission to our church leaders. The Bible teaches submission in marriage. The Bible teaches submission in families. You see, because of our sin nature... We all need human authority over us. Accountability is a virtue. It helps to keep our passions in check. The genius of the American Constitution is this system of checks and balances. Power is disseminated among the executive and legislative and judicial branches. Each branch of government is accountable to the other two branches. Submission is not a necessary evil. It's part of God's plan for us. We're not to fight it. Rather, we're to lean into it. We're to embrace it graciously. The Bible commands us to honor the king. Honor the president whether he's a Republican or a Democrat. Honor your government leaders. Honor law enforcement. Notice how our our culture is struggling with all of this stuff right now, right? Because there's rebellion in the heart of man. But we're called to honor law enforcement. Honor your teachers. Honor your parents. The Bible teaches honor your church leaders. Honor your employers. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. We should not see this as something we have to do. It should be something we want to do. We should want to do these things. Even when our authorities may not be worthy of that respect, God still calls on us to honor them. Something that's, sometimes that's hard to do. It's hard to do. I catch my... Self saying things, I say, Oh Lord, why did I say that? The fifth principle in serving with humility is to serve submissively with a gracious heart. I close with this. Several years ago, a 19 year old college student named Tim Chester attended a conference in Northeast England. He came with a friend. But that friend was well connected and wandered off. So Tim, 19 years old, was left all alone at this conference and he was feeling totally out of place. You ever felt like that? About that time, Tim says, this older man comes over, he begins talking to me. And he was asking me all about myself. And after a few moments, my friend returned And this man, who had been talking to me, introduced himself. He said, hello, I'm John Stott. Now, in case you've never heard of John Stott, he was the most famous pastor in England. 
as well as being a renowned author, scholar, teacher. He's less famous here in the U.S., but still well-known in Christian circles. In one of my first Bible classes I had at Bethel College, our textbook was Basic Christianity by John Stott. After Stott introduced himself, Tim said, my jaw nearly hit the floor. (laughs) I'd been speaking to the great John Stott without realizing it. He said, this moment made a big impression on me. John, who was the only speaker that day, had seen an awkward-looking teenager over in the corner by himself and took it upon himself to make that awkward teenager feel welcome. I met him a few times subsequently, Tim says. He always remembered my name. John Stott has since passed on to glory. But this story should motivate us to ask ourselves some tough questions. Am I obsessed with my social status? Do I rank people by wealth, possessions, influence, their job? And have I surrounded myself with people that I think they can help me move up in society, in wealth, in career, in appearance. John Stott's humility meant that God could entrust him. He was safe to entrust him with great influence and great impact. And you know what, folks? God can do the same with you. Are you ready to pursue true humility? Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we know this is a struggle for our whole culture. And Lord, we would be remiss in thinking it's just our culture and that this same struggle does not reside in our own hearts. Everything out there, God, tells us to look out for number one. Everything out there, all the messages we receive, commercials on television, take care, take care of number one. Take care of you and yours. Us four no more. That mentality, Lord, all around us. We have so many things in our culture that are there just to just to remind us how important we are so father we just lay this before you today as our heads are bowed you may want to just uh, just talk to the lord right now just tell him you know lord i yeah i i struggle with this too i i struggle with this i find myself so uh Maybe it's something you, you don't like about yourself. I don't know why, Lord. I'm just so fixated with my own comfort, my own health, my own friendship circle, my own...